as they say, all is fair and love and war. And of course, this fully extends to patent law, because it's much easier to deal with another country's patent office after you've defeated them in a war. Uh, and that, of course, applies to every country. Uh, there's probably no nation on Earth that hasn't copied a successful weapon from its adversary. Uh, but in this video, I'm going to focus on particularly the USSR and particularly what they copied from Germany before and during World War II. Now, you might say, oh, this is just going to be another video about the AK versus the Sturmgewehr. Uh, and don't worry, I'll get to that in the end. Uh, this is going to go in chronological order. So to start with, uh, the Russian, back then not even Soviet, uh, the Russian tank program began with the capture of the French Renault of T-Tank, which then resulted in a copy called the Russian Renault. And there was no attempt to conceal, even you can tell by the name, there's no attempt made to conceal the fact that this was, in fact, a copy. Uh, it was adapted, of course, to be produced in Russian factories um, during the Russian Civil War, but it was still mostly a copy, even if it used a different engine and slightly different armament. Uh, it was armed with the Hotchkiss revolver gun, which was a, uh, well, individual barrels taken from a naval Hotchkiss gun that was purchased by um, the Imperial Russian Navy for its own ships. So again, this, this tank, it was a copy. There was no attempt to conceal the fact that it was a copy made with uh, barrels taken from a French design, although the USSR later began to make its own 37mm uh, gun barrels in the 1920s. So, no attempts made to conceal that. Uh, the MS-1, on the other hand, that came after it was not a copy. Uh, and I have a whole video comparing it to the Renault of T, and even though they look kind of similar, the MS-1 is an original tank. Uh, it's a two-man tank with a very large wheel in the front and a small wheel in the back, but uh, that's pretty much where the similarities end. Anyway, you can watch my video on that if you have any more questions. Uh, unfortunately, after the MS-1, the USSR kind of ran out of ideas. So there was the uh, MS-1, was its code was T-18. There was a T-19, which was a major modernization of the MS-1, particularly aimed at increasing its speed. There was the T-20, which was a minor modernization, um, again, to increase speed, but put it into production a bit faster. And, well, neither of those tanks was particularly inspiring. And so the um, Directorate of Mechanization and Motorization of the Red Army sent a delegation abroad where they returned with licenses, mind you, not, not just copies, licenses to produce the Vickers Marquis 6 tonner tank and the Christie tank, both of which, of course, were uh, very thoroughly modified and modernized to meet Soviet uh, Soviet requirements, but they were still licensed copies of foreign designs. And that's usually where the story ends. Uh, people say, oh, okay, well, the Christie, uh, the BT tank was just a copy of the Christie, um, and the T-26 is a copy of the Vickers, and, well, there you go. Uh, that kind of misses another major, major influence, and probably even a greater influence in Soviet tank design from Germany. Now, it's no secret that, or at least now it's no secret that, uh, the Germans had a proving grounds and Kazan uh, called Kama in German sources. Uh, in Soviet sources, it's called Teko, Technical Courses of the Oso Aviahim, which was a kind of paramilitary organization for Soviet citizens, uh, where they could get mil paramilitary training before or after the actual military service. Um, and uh, typically, the way the story goes is that, well, the Germans were allowed to test in the USSR and test uh, various weapons that they weren't allowed to have according to the Treaty of Versailles, which is not wrong. Uh, but there is another aspect to that. The technical courses of the Oso Aviahim, of course, were attended by Soviet engineers and Soviet commanders. And these commanders were there to learn from, from the Germans and, well, to copy and steal everything that wasn't nailed down. So there was a great number of technical solutions that were taken from the Germans, um, even if the Germans didn't make good use of them themselves. So uh, the most iconic one is the Soviet tank helmet. The Soviet tank helmet is actually based on the German design. It was based on the German design the German tankers used, at Kama used, and the Germans didn't like it. And during World War II, they had these uh, stylish berets, which, of course, didn't really protect you from bumps and bruises. Uh, the Soviets took the helmet design and they ran with it. So that's a major, major thing um, taken from a German influence. There were other things as well, like uh, coaxial machine guns, 
So if you take a look at the BT-2 tank, for example, early versions don't have a coaxial machine gun. The machine gun is its own separate kind of um, blister on the side of the turret. Uh, but then the BT-5 and uh, T-26 and all those later tanks do have a coaxial machine gun. Um, that gun now design was taken from the German Leicht tractor. Uh, sights as well, the periscopic sight was copied from the Leicht tractor. Um, and the rail antenna, the radio antenna, uh, which was considered to be safer than the whip antenna because it didn't stick up uh, like a big flag saying, look at me, I'm a commander tank, please shoot me. Which, well, later on it turned out that the rail antenna wasn't actually that much more concealed, but uh, at the time the Soviets went, look at that, great antenna design, uh, we're going to steal it. What we are going to do though is put it on the turret rather than on the hull like in uh, German vehicles, but... Early tanks had them, uh, early Soviet radio tanks had them on the hull as well. And so, as you can kind of see, this was a huge inspiration, huge boost to Soviet tank industry, which, well, this was the explicit point of the Kama program. It wasn't like the USSR, uh, on their own goodwill, uh, gave the Germans a proving grounds to test their cutting edge stuff on. They, they wanted a piece of that action. So in addition to this, uh, let's say, inspiration taken from German tanks being tested in, um, in Kazan, there were, of course, more above-ground deals. Uh, so a Rhine Metal 75mm AA gun was purchased uh, legally, and that became the foundation for the Soviet 76mm 3K, uh, 3K AA gun, which then turned into the 85mm 52K, uh, which was a, the most powerful AA gun used by the Red Army during the war, uh, ironically. Uh, similarly, German, uh, the Rhine Metal 37mm anti-tank gun, the famous door knocker, um, that was licensed to produce the 1K, which was considered unsatisfactory. And so uh, the 45mm gun, um, more, it looked very, very similar to the point where uh, in modern reenactments, there are actually repainted 45mm guns representing the German 37mm. Um, but uh, that was another licensed copy that eventually evolved into a whole new Soviet thing. Uh, and again, there's no attempt made to hide this. There's documents in archives regarding the, all of these licensed purchases. Uh, everything was very much above board when it came to uh, purchases of licenses to produce cannons from Rhine metal. But uh, as the Great Patriotic War neared, there was, of course, uh, more difficulty in purchasing licenses from the not-so-friendly Nazi government, um, and, of course, more opportunities to steal and copy stuff. Uh, when a Panzer I was captured during the Spanish Civil War, you can't say that it really had a great influence on... Um, Soviet tank production. The tank was considered to be lightly armored. Uh, the concept of only having machine guns was considered outdated by that point. Um, the lots of various pistol ports and observation ports around the tank weakened its degree of protection. And well, you know, the Panzer I wasn't very satisfactory to the Germans uh, by the, in the late 30s anyway. Where a greater degree of inspiration came from was the Panzer III. Uh, very, there was an opportunity to examine um, a stolen and not even captured stolen. A guy just got into it uh, and then drove away, much to a scandal between the uh, Red Army and the Nazis um, in Poland in September of 1939. And then later in 1940, the USSR did legally purchase a Panzer III from the Germans to study. And so this tank was a huge, huge boost to Soviet tank industry again. Um, the torsion bar suspension, they already had that. That was tested on the KV. Uh, last year it was tested on the T-28 and put into production on the KV. But uh, things like the layout of the commander's cupola, um, the dual machine guns in um, paired to the gun, uh, lights that were uh, that the commander could use to signal the driver. Uh, the driver also had a signal for when the gun was overhanging either side of, uh, of the tank, so I guess he wouldn't bump into anything. All of that was noticed in, in the tank that the USSR purchased, and uh, Factory 174 received a nice list of features that explicitly says, this is from the Panzer III tank, we want this. We want this on our tanks. At the time, that was the uh, T-50. So the T-50 tank was kind of the Soviet take on uh, the Panzer III. 
And well, if you just look at it, you, you can hardly say this is a copy of the German tank. But again, there was a number of features uh, that were borrowed, not, you know, uh, not exactly legally, but still very much acknowledging that, yes, we stole this, so what? We want to make the best tank possible, and uh, we don't care where our ideas come from. Um, this sort of practice of borrowing German designs continued through the war. Uh, most noticeably the muzzle brake on um, the uh, IS-2 tank. So the original T-shaped muzzle brake didn't do so well in trials. Most famously, it ruptured when the gun fired and nearly killed uh, Varshilov's uh, adopted son, which was not really a political win. Uh, and so they decided to copy a German design, particularly the muzzle brake of the Ferdinand, the Pac-43. Um, of course, it was enlarged a little bit uh, to meet the new caliber, but um, it was referred to in documents as the Ferdinand muzzle brake. Again, no attempt whatsoever to conceal the fact that this was a uh, German copy that was put into production. Of course, it didn't last in production long. Um, in the spring, it was replaced with a domestic design. Uh, but the fact that that design was called muzzle brake number eight kind of suggests that... Uh, there was a number of trial and error to get to the point, and it was much more expedient to take a tried and true German design than to uh, delay the ice to going into production trying to figure out something on your own. By the way, not not a, a, exclusive to the Soviets. Um, the muzzle brake on the American 76mm gun is also copied from a uh, German muzzle brake, but um, the 75mm Pac-40. So this is hardly a full list, but I think you get the idea. Uh, the USSR had absolutely no qualms about copying stuff from the Germans, uh, whether it was legally purchased or stolen or scavenged in the battlefield. Uh, but they also had no qualms about attributing these ideas to the original source. So when you're reading about this muzzle brake or um, the 37mm uh, anti-tank gun, it says in all the documents, yep, this is a German design, we copied it, we improved it, here you go, here's your thing. And that is where we get to the AK and the Sturmgewehr. Uh, despite the visual similarities between the two weapons, uh, no one's really ever found a document that says, oh cool, here's this German gun, uh, we're going to copy it. In Kalashnikov's own memoirs, he does actually reference a foreign design that inspired his work, uh, not on the AK, on the carbine that preceded it, but the foreign source of inspiration that he describes is the American Garand rifle. Uh, and his carbine actually used an end block clip that, uh, well, the Red Army didn't really like it. But uh, again, there was no attempt made to conceal the source of inspiration. And so, if you can tell, obviously, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. But uh, if there's plenty of evidence, um, no attempt made to hide the foreign influence on all these other guns and tanks and various other features. But no one's found anything on the AK to date. Well, maybe the influence is not as direct as some people would like to believe. But interestingly enough, there is a kernel of truth to this. So the Soviet 762 by 39 cartridge, uh, what's called the Model 1943, was directly inspired by uh, the German 7.9mm Kurz. And uh, when the early versions of the um, MKB H42, so not even the uh, MP. Uh, Sturmgewehr 43 or MP44, the predecessor, the prototypes to that, when these weapons were captured, the Soviets went, great, we don't really care about the gun that much, what we really want is this round, this this short round that packs almost as much punch as a full-size rifle round, but it's much smaller, much lighter. Uh, we want to put it in not an assault rifle, but a carbine, uh, something like the Kalashnikov's, uh, Kalashnikov Petrov carbine that failed trials uh, and lost to the SKS. So uh, even, and again, there's no attempt made to conceal the fact that, hey, this German round is pretty cool. We want to copy it. We want to, well, maybe not even really copy, um, make a smaller version of our own ammunition um, that is nevertheless inspired by the, uh, the German round. But again, the gun that the Soviets wanted to put this in was not an assault rifle like the Sturmgewehr, it was a carbine like the SKS. Um, and as you can see, no attempt is made to conceal this, uh, and yet no similar trail has been found uh, about the AK to date. Uh, in conclusion, the Soviets were really not against copying uh, good ideas regardless of what nation they came from, but also they, uh, at least in internal classified documents, gave credit where credit is due.